from Princeton Consultants. We're a Grobe premier partner. Uh, Princeton was founded over 35 years ago by our CEO, Steve Sashahara, and COO, John Crummeller. Uh, we, uh, our tagline is Information Technology and Management Consulting. When the firm was started, primarily the work was in management consulting, looking for strategy and process improvement, but the uh, founders immediately saw that information technology was the way to deliver the value in terms of process improvement. And now uh, a lot of our work is in advanced analytics. Uh, we deliver applications often in operational environments that need to run 24 by 7. Um, and that are based often on advanced analytics and optimization. Um, so Princeton's been doing optimization long before I got here four years ago. Um, we've had many successful projects. Our clients uh, range from a lot of different companies, uh, primarily in transportation. Our staff includes around 85 full-time consultants, about two-thirds with graduate STEM degrees. We actually hire a lot of physics PhDs. And we also have a network of outside consultants that we hire occasionally and work with university professors, and uh, many of our staff are experienced with data science and doing software development. Our senior staff average over 15 years of experience. Many of our staff start uh, soon after finishing their uh, educational work and stay with the firm for many years. Um, Steve likes to joke that given I've only been here four years that I drove down the average a little bit. Um, so uh, we, we've done a lot of projects. As you can see on the next slide, our clients uh, range at the top. We do a lot of work in transportation. You'll see some of the big names that you hopefully recognize. Uh, our second group is we've done a lot of work in the financial arena. And uh, our third group really ranges uh, from a variety of companies such as Dow Jones, Quad Graphics that does printing, to farm, pharmacies, air products, et cetera. Um, not all of these customers are doing necessarily optimization or advanced analytics. A lot of them just need process improvement that we deliver via delivering often by delivering software applications, uh, but many of them end up doing some form of analytics as part of our work that we do for them. Uh, so now I want to talk about our advanced analytics model review and validation service. So uh, this is a service that we've created. What we have have found as we've worked with different clients is that they have existing models, both in the optimization space, but also in the predictive analytics world. Uh, and we found that they we created a structured service that lets us go in and work with them and understand what's happening with their models and see if there are places for improvement. So some of the benefits of this service is that it allows you to validate and improve your optimization and predictive models uh, using us as an independent third party. Um, it allows uh, new areas for improvement to be found. Um, you can determine whether your models and your best practices are being used by the group. Um, often we find as we work with uh, analytics professionals, uh, they sometimes there's a disconnect between them and the business people, and so we can help uh, bridge that gap. And we also, um, by doing this and bringing our best practices, uh, the specialists that are there often see how they can improve their skills for their future work within their firms. The kind of questions that we address um, are first, what's a correct model and what makes a model correct? Um, so understanding how it gets mapped to the business problem. An important aspect is how data gets integrated. Um, how Once you have uh, a, an analytics application, whether it's predictive or optimization, you have to look at how solutions are published and how are they actually used in the business processes. Um, we ask questions about to understand how the models were validated to see that they meet the needs of the business. We do sensitivity analysis, so changing the data and seeing how the answers change with respect to how it affects the business. Um, we also look at how often uh, the quality of the models are assessed, especially considering that data changes and the business changes. Um, we look at whether the practitioner thought they implemented a model that did something, but did that model actually do what the practitioner thought it does? We look at whether data is captured to understand the performance of the systems. And then in cases where there are random number generation techniques that are used, um, are they reproducible so that you can see that you can re reproduce the way solutions are generated? Um, in general, our engagements start by interviewing stakeholders from the business and development analytics development to understand what is the business problem and the context. So we tr really try to make sure we understand the business problem. Just like we do when we start a new engagement, we first work with the business uh, owners to see where the value will be delivered. We 
we look at and do a review of existing models and procedures, look at, uh, especially look at the data sources. Um, a way of validating that a model has been implemented correctly is to re-implement it in a different language, a different technology, modifying the language or different engines that are used. Um, we do experiments with the models to try to uncover issues. And finally, we uh, issue a, a report that makes our suggestions for improvements and places where there could be further investigation that is done. In the case of optimization, we um, will answer these kind of questions. One of them is, often in optimizations, problems have multiple optimal solutions, and if you choose a different algorithm, you get a different answer. So if you're getting a different answer, how does that affect how the business operates? What is it possible that some data could be presented that would make the model infeasible, and is that appropriately being trapped? Um, one of the other issues that comes into place is are how does data actually get created for the model? Is it grabbed from a database? Are there modifications that are done to it? And how do you handle the issues of precision versus accuracy? And that's one of the topics we'll talk about later with Ugo. Um, if you're using a solver, um, a lot, we often see code where people aren't checking to see, are they checking for various errors that the solver can report? Did, was, the thing, was the code design and the model design that allow future model updates to occur? Um, as the data changes, will the model appropriately scale? So um, changing the granularity of time, increasing the granularity of space, or other things that can make a, a number of products, um, how well the model work as that data scales. Using looking at the solver, with it, working with our clients that use Garovi, are they taking advantage of all the latest features in Garovi to get the best performance and, uh, and best answers possible? Um, one of the questions that occurs in mixed integer programming is we often see problems where most of the solution time is taken getting the last few percent of provable optimality, and we ask the question, is that pure optimality really needed? And then uh, finally, we'll also say if performance is important, would an alternate model work? And we'll see an example of that later uh, in the work we did with Remsoft. Um, one of the important aspects of what we do is looking at how data feeds the system. Um, and there's two sources of data in general. One are some automatic feeds. So you'll see a picture here that I've drawn of one database feeding another database, feeding another database, which eventually feeds into a model. And what happens as time goes on is things about these databases can change. Um, we had one client where they had uh, an example where they had a field that was a time, a, a time duration that was given in minutes. And someone then made a decision to change that time to be a unit of seconds. Well, the model was assuming minutes, and that messed up what was happening in the model and was changing the answer. So you have to w watch out for how these databases change and make sure that you're continually checking the assumptions of your data. The second source of data is in user inputs. Um, so there was a project that I was working on at IBM where we were um, doing things to allocate according to a budget, and the budgets were typically in the tens of millions of dollars, and we had tested our models with that. So a separate team had built uh, a user interface for this application, and they sent it off somewhere to get tested, and the people who were testing um, entered a number that was like $50 trillion, and our model failed. And so we had to build in some alerts that would say, this is not the kind of value that you would enter, um, because it made no sense to have a $50 trillion budget. So um, building in those kind of alerts for user data um, needs to be part of the process. So I often say it's all about the data. When you're delivering an application, the users don't distinguish between bad data and bugs. If the data gets bad and they see that the recommendation from the optimization system isn't good, they'll basically say it doesn't work. And it's not your model, it's the data. And it becomes very difficult to verify the solutions and you get a lot of frustration. So our solution here is that for us in all of our projects and we recommend to our clients as part of this review that the data cleaning and checking process is a core component of optimization. So understanding why something is happening includes understanding and looking at the incoming data. Um, and you wanna make sure that the users have the capability to change the data where possible. Uh, you know, I can give a couple of examples of some current clients. Uh, we have one client that has some network co data coming in where they're looking at where drivers can meet loads. And uh, when you look at the network, it doesn't correspond to the reality from the planning perspective to what's actually happening in the execution's perspective. 
And even this morning, I got data from a client we're working with. Uh, they updated a data set and they changed the names of some of the fields. So our code's breaking. Now we're in a POC concept con uh, part of that project. Those are the types of things that happen. So you always have to be very cognizant that it, the data and the quality of that data is, can have a major effect on your optimization application. Um, we have a methodology uh, that we've decided to codify here in this diagram that we've been using with clients that we call the Princeton Optimization Implementation Verification Methodology. And so given an application, how do you verify that it's based on optimization that it's doing what you expect? So the first thing that we do is we instrument the application and we determine some formal optimization algorithm metrics. Those metrics can include things like your objective function values, which constraints are being satisfied um, as, in terms of being tight versus loose. Um, it will also include things related to, uh, to performance. How long is something taking to solve? How long does it take to find a feasible solution? So we'll instrument the code to collect uh, those data. And then we do uh, what we call the analyze and stret. So the first thing is you create a baseline of the current implementation of the metrics. And then try to understand from those metrics where are the potential failure and underperformance results, uh, underperformance areas, um, aggregate the results, and, and continue to look at the previous results. Uh, finally, we act as an adversary, trying to think of what will make the model break, what will make the application break. So these, this will stress the application. We create those data sets and compare the different uh, the metrics that we get. Um, as we do that, then we look to improve. So try to figure out what things can we do to improve the model, the algorithms, et cetera, in order to reduce the outliers that have come from the metrics, and then try to improve the optimization solution and quality, rerun again, and loop back to this analyze and stress phase. At each point in time, we can have a stable version that can be passed on for integration and testing, and the app that implementation can be going into the regular QA processes. One of the things that we want to stress is that the QA process for an optimization application is different than the QA that is done for a classic uh, application that you write. And so one of the discussions that we typically have with clients here is making them realize that their standard QA processes aren't stress testing the optimization application, um, and that's why you need a specialized procedure such as the one we've created, described here. One of the techniques that we have started using more often, more recently, is simulation, which can help with model validation. My colleague, Patricia Randall, uh, wrote an article that appeared in Analytics Magazine last summer um, describing how we use simulation to help validate our optimization-based applications. Um, one of the advantages of the simulation packages is that they allow you to create graphical views of the solution so you can see what's going on. Um, it also allows robust testing, so it, we can validate the data and visualize the data to see if the data is correct. Um, we often are building applications that are going to be pulling data from other systems using REST APIs, so this allows us to test those REST APIs without being directly integrated to the production systems. We can fine-tune our model and getting an end-user buy-in. So the picture that you see here is from a project we did with a railroad where we were looking at where to uh, park uh, the rail cars in an inter intermodal yard, and by visualizing the decisions in the blue where um, uh, containers that had to be moved into the parking area, the red were the park containers, we, the uh, users could see how the optimization was going to recommend where things should go, and they would then tell us, no, you wouldn't do this, we would do that, and we can modify our model accordingly to uh, reflect their preferences. So this is becoming a useful tool for us for us in terms of validating models. So with that, I'm going to turn things now over to Hugo, who can talk about REMSOF and the engagement that Princeton did with REMSOF. I'm not sure how many people are listening know about REMSOF, and so I'm going to give a quick overview of our company um, first and then talk about some of the things we discovered in, in the review. Uh, we've been in the optimization business for almost 30 years. Uh, we started in the late 80s and continue today and work with people around the world. We focus largely on modeling problems related to large infrastructure and primarily forestry. And to date, there are 15 countries and more than 150 clients. Briefly, this is just a view of some of our forestry clients. Uh, 
you can group them broadly into governments who have responsibility to manage lands, uh, vertically integrated forestry companies, company forest companies that own land and the mills and the facilities where the wood products are, are utilized, and uh, financial investors and, and, uh, and others. Planning that our clients use our software for includes everything from long-term strategic harvest plans down to crew scheduling and resource allocation on, on a weekly basis. One thing that's kind of unique is that of all of these clients, their models are unique to them. And even within a particular organization, those clients may have several distinct models that they use. A quick overview of our technology. We have two platforms for optimization planning and decision support. There's a modeling the Woodstock modeling platform, which we use on the desktop and has been around since uh, the early 90s, and a more recent addition, the Remsoft Rise platform for the cloud, which is, is, is in production and has been used for now for a couple of years. Together, they, they form the foundation of all of our planning uh, problems, but it's really the desktop modeling platform that I'm going to be talking about today. If you look at our platform, there are a number of components to this technology. There's a modeling engine in which we have a syntax editor and algorithm. This modeling language allows uh, us users to represent a business or planning problem in a, in a, in a, that's suitable for modeling. The advantage of this structure, though, is, is we, we like to call this math for the masses, in that when we developed this modeling language, we aimed it at people who were not operations or research OR analysts, but they still needed to develop models. It's kind of a wonderful, terrible thing because it's an efficient way to get lots of people to use optimization, but sometimes there are gotchas where they do things that may not be the smartest thing to do, and we'll talk about some of those things today. We have a lot of ways we can adjust our, our modeling language. We have Allocation Optimizer, which allows us to introduce decisions uh, for transport transportation of wood from the forest to mills and, and facilities. A lot of our problems have a spatial component to them, whether they're opening size, clear cut size, distance from uh, facilities. And so we have an algorithms in our spatial optimizer, which allows us to do some more spatial modeling. Um, we have regimes, regimes module, which allows us to do multi-period scheduling and, and multi, multi kind of action um, prescription formulations. And it, of course, we have solvers. Uh, I believe we've been selling an OEM version of Groby for more than 10 years now. It's not all optimization. We do have a range of things. We can do deterministic uh, uh, inventory projections, binary search, Monte Carlo optimizations, of course, goal program, and then a number of, of these heuristics. We have a number of tools to help for debugging our models, for visualizing our models, for mapping our models. And we had finally have a data integration component which allows us to easily access data from uh, virtually any data source. So on the work we did with Princeton and, and this review, we have a number of clients doing different things. We have crew scheduling models, we have transportation harvesting models, we have long-term strategic or habitat management models. And then we have what we call our highly complex MIP problems. We have a number of clients who, because of the way the model is structured, are forced to use uh, mixed integer programming. And, and, and sometimes we're getting uh, very complex models that are quite large in size. And this introduces, obviously, a, a number of problems. This uh, the two lines in red illustrates one of a, one of our a log report from one of the matrices that we built. Uh, we'll talk about this model in a little bit, but this is a fairly large model. And, and when you get up towards of almost 5 million columns and, and almost a million rows with almost 200,000 uh, integer and binary uh, variables. The other problem that we get is that people use these models, they frequently refresh the data. And so you'll get a model working, you'll get a model tuned properly, everything's nice. And then they change the data and the problems change a bit and things start to fall apart or become much more difficult. So the issue we were faced with was, well, we sometimes have unreasonably long solve times. So we think a couple of days is unreasonably long. And, and then sometimes even after a day, the solutions, we're not finding any gaps. And this stuff, this, these runs tended to be unpredictable. We certainly can work with different tuning parameters for Garobi, but since the models are different between clients, what works for one model may not work for the other model. And so we have a tough time sometimes figuring what those out. And if models take 24 hours to solve, tuning isn't really a viable option sometimes. It's adding constraints to models obviously sometimes make solving harder, but sometimes removing constraints make solving harder. And these are the kind of things that were baffling us. 
Obviously, adding constraints is never a good thing, but we also have the issue that some of our clients are reluctant to simplify the models or reduce their constraints. And so I guess our question for Princeton consultants was, okay, are there things we can do to tweak our modeling platform to improve solver performance? Are there better ways to structure some of these models? And can we improve Groby's performance by changing parameters? And finally, I guess, are there best practices that they can share with us that we can then share with our clients? That's a bit of the background. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the results we, we've exposed in a review. Irv mentioned precision and accuracy earlier on. That was one of the first uh, items that we, we discussed when he was here. And the issue, I guess, is that double precision may be too precise for some of the some of the data with respect to the business problem. Certainly double precision is important when we get into the math and the solving of the details in terms of how we build these matrices. But double precision in terms of input data may be a bit too precise. For example, we have uh, a lot of the data that we use to generate our, our models, our matrices, comes from geographic information systems, and we have data down to accuracy of, of square meters or less. But the question is, is that reasonable to do that in a model when you have millions of acres asking for something that is accurate down to six or seven decimal places, uh, maybe a bit too, too accurate. So I guess the recommendation and best practice that was suggested was that we should carefully consider the accuracy of our input data, maybe use less precision at the input level, but certainly use from a modeling or algorithmic perspective, use the double precision there. Yes, and so, Ugo, as you mentioned, one of the things that was happening is that sometimes the data was coming in and the model was, uh, the, which were created by the Remsoft clients, would be multiplying different numbers, such as rates and percentages, which would then mean that the data was getting down to levels that made no sense from a, a geographic perspective. A asking for ac accuracy down to millimeters or micrometers really doesn't make sense. So it, you, using and figuring out what is the right level of precision with respect to the data and in terms of how accurate you really need to be is something you need to think about. We've seen this in other engagements when it comes to things related to money. People will have uh, constraints where they're measuring the number of dollars and they have a budget, but if the budgets are in the millions of dollars, asking for accuracy to the penny may not be reasonable. Um, so understanding this and, and using the right units with respect to uh, the representation of the data and understanding how uh, computations will occur that, that do things both with respect to constraints as well as objectives if you have objectives that involve money, asking, and again, the dollar amounts are going to be in the tens of millions of dollars, asking the optimizer to come up with solutions that are accurate to very low optimization tolerances may not be appropriate given that the difference of a few dollars in a solution really isn't going to affect the overall solution. Thanks, sir. Another issue that came up was the Remsoft use of, or Remsoft and clients' use of what we'll call a multiple objectives. Uh, Remsoft, with our modeling system, has always had the ability to specify goals and, and to help us determine in, in feasibilities. We can create constraints that are really soft goals, where the the objective is to minimize the penalties, minimize the deviations from uh, what's desired. But what we've been doing over time is 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 we create an objective that's blended. So if our objective maybe is is net present value or, or net revenue, what we could do is we can create an objective that says maximize net present value minus the penalties. So one objective function with multiple parts. Now this state probably dates back to early 90s and, and early parts of 2000s where we weren't doing a lot of work with mixed integer programs. And it, it works quite efficiently. You get a, a one run and you can have everything happen without having to uh, try several times. But as Irv pointed out, this is not very constructive or not an advantage when you're using MIP formulations. It can make the solver's life very difficult. And so what we came up with the problem that we had, I guess, is we had one client who was trying to find solutions to a large problem. And the problem he had is if he set the, the model to run it in the evening, it, he, if it was infeasible, he'd come in the morning and he knew he was infeasible, he'd then have to adjust the constraints, do it, get work again, and it, it was wasting a lot of time. So we created a kind of internal hierarchical process where we create matrices with two objective functions. One would be the max net revenue. The other objective would be to, to minimize goal penalties. But what we did when we built the matrix with these two objective functions, all the constraints were built with the with the slack added to the constraint. But in the first instance, what we do is we 
bind the penalty functions to be zero. We put an upper bound and say, even though the, the, the slack variables are in the matrix, we, we can't solve that. You can't add values to those bounds the first time. So our clients can build a matrix in this form and, and simply say, go. What happens then when we detect an infeasibility, we automatically will switch to the objectives. We'll reduce, we'll take the bound off the penalty functions and solve again, finding out what the constraints were that were causing the problem. We then adjust the constraints and adjust the ob objective function again and solve again. You're basically giving us a hierarchical process with when one button push basically, we can do what would have taken people many hours before with many steps in between. Yes, and so um, Ugo, as you mentioned, when we first came in and, and worked together, the typical way that the software was used was that the blending was occurring between these goals that were minimizing penalties which were typically in a different unit than the objective function, which would have been related to the cost in dollars. So we recommended a hierarchical approach. Now, we did this a couple of years ago, and since that time, Groby has actually added support for using multiple objective functions. And uh, they support both uh, the blended and the hierarchical approach. Um, in general, in the projects that we've done with clients, we end up using the hierarchical approach, and because it's more easily to explain uh, with respect to the business requirements. And we've actually been giving some recent feedback to Groby about some things that uh, we'd like to see in this approach. It continues to improve, but uh, it used to be that I had to code these myself, and now it, they're very convenient using the new API in recent versions of Groby that supports having multiple objectives. Thanks, Irv. The previous two uh, observations were, were things we did actually in our modeling system, we changed things. Some of the recommendations that reflected things that people were doing themselves in our model, and that was a little bit of what we talked about on the previous slide. But but where we have constraints and where we're building models that have constraints on on outputs that have really are different things, whether they're dollars or whether they're hectares or whether they're acres, uh, we can create these as soft constraints and and, and measure the total violation. And, and typically, and it may be laziness on some part, maybe not knowing but, but on others, but people will often will mix those without uh, considering the fact that they're different. And so when you put them into the objective function as or as a goal, doing these funny things and and the model may not produce results that you want. One recommendation that uh, Irv suggested is maybe we should normalize those constraints. So if we know what the quantities should be or we know about what they should be, normalize them so that the related constraints would be at least uh, both used as a percentage violation. The other opportunity, of course, is to weigh the constraints in the penalty function, but sometimes it's hard to come up with a reasonable value for those because you don't really know what the, how much this is relative to the other. So normalization may be a, a better approach, and this becomes one of our recommendations as well. Our next uh, recommendation, which um, was a little bit counterintuitive, was to add extra constraints. So in one of the MIT models that Remsoft had from one of their customers, um, there were some, when we understood what the model was doing, found that there were some variables that were implicitly binary due to a combination of constraints, but those variables were not declared as binary. And because the com combination of constraints is what made them binary, um, the Groby pre-solve was not figuring out they were supposed to be binary with the constraints as the model was formulated. So the recommendation here is we actually took the model, specified that those variables were binary, added some additional constraints that linked those binaries with other variables, so they now had an effect. And what that meant is that Groby would see those variables as, as binary, it could branch on those variables, and it could also create stronger cuts because it saw them as binary variables. The net result was even though we had added extra constraints, and both in terms of extra linear constraints, as well as declared some of the variables to be binary, the Groby pre-solve actually created a smaller problem and the solution times went down from being hours and minutes. So while we always think that presenting less constraints to the solver is better, there's actually times where adding extra constraints can provide extra information for the solver in order to improve the overall performance. Thanks, sir. Of course, if, if you engage with Princeton and you have lots of models like Remsoft does, we probably have hundreds, literally hundreds of different, different models from various clients in our office. If you go to do a review, we're gonna, we did, and uh, we gave Irv obviously some of the toughest ones first to, to see if we could improve things. 
Uh, this this model was a forestry model, and, and the model that it represented was it represented a, a chunk of land in North America there were, that had about what we'll call 2,700 different harvest units that we wanted to harvest over the, the next year. The year was divided up into 13 periods, and so the goal was to generate a harvest schedule that harvested these uh, harvest units, but we had up to let's say, eight different harvest systems which which we could harvest those stands. Uh, when those stands were harvested, they produced uh, some mix of up to 30 different products. Uh, and then once those products were, were harvested, we then had to use, select one of four different transportation methods to get the wood to one of 70 different mills. And so that represented a fairly large problem. The, the red lines we saw in the earlier um, slide represent the, the general size of that matrix, but it was of the magnitude of 5 million variables and maybe 200,000 integer variables. But one of the nasty things, is, in addition to the, what I've, I've outlined, is that there was a requirement when we harvest that the machines we use, uh, if we use them, then there was a minimum number that we had to use and a maximum number that we had to use. And those um, final constraints became very, uh, very hard for the model to solve. The model actually took many hours to solve, and this is also the model that we used as the kind of the genesis for this hierarchical goal formulation. It was this model because it took so long to solve. So what occurred in this case, as shown on the slide, is that there was a constraint that basically uh, said that if you um, use uh, a machine, then you must use at least a certain number of machines in a period. And so, and the way that was formulated was that there was a binary variable um, that would then work to create the semi-integer nature of the machine's variable. And this binary variable was used elsewhere in the model. Um, as Hugo mentioned, um, this model was taking uh, many hours, uh, close to a day, to even get any kind of reasonable solution. Um, and so one of the things w we looked at was if we took this variable and we made it to no longer be declared as an integer variable, Groby could actually solve that large problem that, that Hugo mentioned to about a 1% gap in 39 minutes. So this then led to the conclusion that these were the variables that are, were making the problem difficult. And it was based on experience in knowing that things involving semi-continuous, semi-integer variables tend to have that types of things. We then, by understanding that, we were able to come up with a new formulation where we add, added additional variables and constraints that would interact with these B variables so that they would generate stronger cuts for Groby. And the additional formulation was capturing some of the implicit interactions occurring between variables and adding these new, new constraints and variables meant that Garobi could generate stronger cuts and then we were able to get solutions which were taking you know close to a day to get we were able I think we ended up getting solutions down to about an hour wasn't that correct Hugo? Yeah I think so. And so um, this is again two types of things occurring here which is if you have a, a complex mid-signature programming model with lots of different kinds of variables, relaxing the variables in groups from being integer to non-integer can help you understand what is making the problem harder to solve. And then you can study the problem and say, are there additional constraints or variables that you can introduce that will give more information about what, how those variables should be, values should be set. Those were a few of the highlights of the review process, and I guess so. F f there were more. I mean, we learned a lot through the process. But following the engagement, we did change and we did do a few things to our, our modeling system, and we and, and we also uh, had now started recommending other things. So, first few th things we did, we made some programming changes to our, our uh, modeling system to address the rounding issues. Now we can turn. Uh, we, users are able to manually uh, round values off even if the input data is, uh, is not presented that way. We've implemented a, a new feature that where units are now uh, optionally put into our modeling platform. In the past, uh, units were required and, and units by not being required, it was up to the user to kind of make sure things worked properly. And when they were multiplying things together, they, they were appropriate to be multiplied together. The, the difficulty and what we 
couldn't do as a result of that, which was what was Princeton pointed out, it, it made scaling actually fairly hard to implement um, because you couldn't say, just take all my dollars and divide by a thousand very quickly because we have uh, outputs all over the place and the units were not, not necessarily obvious. And so we've implemented a process where we can uh, apply units to our models and very easily now scale our coefficients that go into the matrix. We've increased the number of debugging tools. We spend a lot of time looking at numbers and matrices. Irv started us doing that almost day one when he came. And so looking at the numbers in the database gives you uh, ideas of what might be going wrong or what's making things difficult. And we've produced a number of internal tools to help uh, make that easy. We have certainly employed some of these best practices. We point out it within our company, but we've also added these prints and recommendations to our, our model audit system uh, service that we provide for our, our clients. So uh, I'd like to conclude um, here with uh, talking some of the things that, that you know, we see from the perspective at Princeton. Um, when you're looking at to deploy optimization models, you really need to bring in different kinds of expertise. One is an understanding of how do you do modeling and understand the algorithms. Some of the analysis uh, that we also did for REMSOFT involved understanding the use of interior point methods in, um, in some of their linear programming models and what was happening there with respect to performance. You also have to understand testing, and, and testing from the perspective of optimization as well as from software development, and finally, software engineering. So you have to build uh, good software. We've had clients um, who are complaining about performance, and it turns out that the solver is doing just fine, and the time issues were all in how they were assembling the data and building the model for the solver. So what we like to say is that if you bring, uh, if you talk to us uh, and use us as an independent party to review your models, then you can make sure it's delivering the business value you expect. And one of the things to recognize, and we have a lot of experience in this area, is that when you deploy optimization models in real-time systems, it, it is a challenge to get right. We have a lot of number of clients that are running optimization in 24 by 7 operational systems, hands off. Um, and doing that in a robust and reliable way is really a challenge, and we use those learnings in terms of how we can talk to you about the work that you're doing on your opt optimization applications. So we like to say as kind of a tagline um, in our next bullet here is, what kind of percentage of your models have errors? Do you really know? And we can help you determine that uh, if you uh, give us a call here at Princeton.